Can I have a volunteer, please? Sham. Yeah. Would you want to come up in the front, please? Sure. All right. Tell us what you did yesterday, but you can't use the letter N in any word. Okay. Uh, yesterday I woke up, then I got a Then? Uh, then? Oh, wait, you said N. N, the letter N. Oh, the letter N. Anywhere in the word, not just at the beginning. N. Okay. The letter N. You worked out the first part. I woke up yesterday. I woke up yesterday. <laughs> I woke up yesterday. Um, I got ready for work. Uh, I first watched uh, my boy uh, while my wife was at school. And then, and, or, uh, <laughs> um, after she came home, I, I left work. So, <laughs> so I worked for, uh, for four, uh, seven hours. Bah. So, uh, so All right. Good. Thank you. <laughs> that is super hard to do. Uh, and that's a good example of what it takes someone who doesn't have English as their first language, how you have to struggle for, you have to think about every word, right? Let's see, does that have an N in it? And you had to think about every word. That's what a lot of our non-English speakers go through. So that's a little empathy exercise to help you realize how we take English for granted. And our friends here that weren't born uh, speaking English, uh, how, how, how difficult it is that they are struggling for, for words when it just flows off an English speaker's native tongue. So uh, I appreciate your prayer, Kimball. You, you, have, you have excellent English. Thank you. Let's, uh, for fun, let's get to know each other better. Tell us where you were born. Start over here in the corner. Ashley? Uh, well, I was born in San Antonio, but I grew up in Rancho Cucumbe, California. Sandy? Sandy. 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 San Clemente, okay. San Clemente, California, there. What, what famous, what president's home was in San Clemente? I don't know. Ri Richard Nixon had his California home in San Clemente, one of them. Why, why don't you say your name so people over there, they can't read your plat, plat cards, or oh, your place card. Uh, I'm Natalie, and I was born in Maryland. Maryland. I'm not. I, I'm not so sure he was born on Earth. <laughs> See, that's just to verify, to relieve those doubts. He was actually born on this planet, as strange as that may seem. Where? Abby, we're just saying where your name and where you were born. My name is Abigail. I was born in Utah. What part? Um, Lawrence, but Edison Provo. All right, Matt, so where were you born? Wrangell, Alaska. You were born actually in Alaska, and that's where you've lived most of your life. Yeah. All right. Anyway, Thad? Oh, I was Thad, and I was born in Logan, Utah. I'm Charles, and I was born in Holiday, Utah. I'm Jordan, and I was born in... A little louder. Jordan, I was born in Virginia. What part? What part of Virginia? Carly, you might as well tell us who we see every day. Tell us your name so everyone knows who you are. Yeah, who are you? Oh. I'm sorry. Hi, I'm Carla. I'm from Bolivia. Born in Bolivia. From where? Bolivia. Bo oh, really? Yeah. Bolivia? <laughs> wow. And, and where have you spent most of your life? Um, Bolivia. Bolivia? Okay. And your associate? My name's Carmona. From, from where? Here. Here. Okay. I'm Amber and I'm from Oregon. My name is Kahana and I'm born in Los Angeles, California, but I grew up in Utah. Okay. My name is Andreas. I was born and raised in Sabinas, California, Ecuador. <laughs> My name is Kahana and I'm I was 
Ivana Gomes, born in the Big Island. Here? Yeah. In Laie? Uh, or Honolulu. Honolulu. And you, you grew up in Honolulu? No, I grew up in Honolulu. What why were you born here? I here BYU Hawaii? And how many else had parents that went to BYU Hawaii? A oh, good third of you. Right? Or you just, Ryan, I was born in uh, Los Angeles. Right. Who else? Connie, you were born in Los Angeles too? Do you remember which hospital? No. Nope. Oh, okay. You didn't look around and yeah. get your bearings. So. All right. UCLA Medical Center. UCLA Medical Center. Not Martin Luther King. I was thinking you were on the, the Martin Luther King one. No. All right. Isn't there like 50 of those in the States? <laughs> and was Seth, I was born in the Cruz Monte also. And Sean, I was born in the Monte Carlo Monte. Of course. And Sean, I was born in China. Ch Ch mainland China? Yeah, mainland China. Very uh, northeast, very close to the border of North Korea. And did you, you grow up in mainland China? Yeah. What part of Utah? Salt Lake. What part of Salt Lake? Conwood Hospital. Conwood Hospital. You know, they've, they've basically <coughs> closed that now? Yeah. yeah. I'm Anthony. I was born in Upland, California. Well, I've got several in California. Nobody in, nobody in Europe, right? Oh, sorry, we missed Tony. I'm Anthony. I was born in Nigeria. Nigeria. OK. Yes, Oh, yes, Michael, you came in. Um, Michael, I was born in Salt Lake City. Which hospital, do you remember? I have the slightest idea. Yeah. That's, you've never been curious? I've tried to avoid you, <laughs> who wants to uh, Who wants to list the eight on the board? Officer Head. OK. Or do you, you just want to call them out and I'll write them? Um, what are the initials? What? Gross profit. Gross profit. Um, uh, are unique and proprietary regulatory Up. officials. QT. SE. Oh, let's see. No, it was that one. Cost oh, time. well, cost and time. And what are we missing? Okay, potential threats. Who wants to explain what PT is? A little louder. Okay, and and what they can do? Yeah. If I come out with this product, what will happen in the marketplace? How will they react? And you want to think through that and say, if I do this, what could other people potentially do? And you have to be real creative on that because you know, your competition isn't going to sit on their hands and do nothing. They might, but you might get someone that gets really mad at you and goes, what you'll find a lot is some companies, they will get attacked just for ego or for vengeance or revenge or you know you'll have a guy that will come up with an idea he'll leave his parent company go start his own company and they will come after him with lawsuits and try to shut him down even though they can't maybe do it they'll try just for vengeance i've seen that many times where you're just you're just ticked off at that employee for coming up with an idea, and so you want to just make their life miserable. So you, you throw lawyers at them, and usually the bigger company has more legal resources to throw at the little guy who's just starting the business. And so you, you may think, oh, this is a very minor one, but I've seen this sink many companies that were just trying to get started, and the big boy came along and sunk the little boy 
before they could get very far. So don't underestimate that one, you know. Especially here's what I just was talking to a fellow a couple months ago. He's looking at leaving his current employer and taking an idea, and I'm gonna I say, that employer, they're gonna say you developed that idea on their time, that that's their idea. And his response is, no, they aren't interested in doing that. You know, that they haven't, they don't want to do that. They haven't, I've, I've told them about that before and they don't want to do that. They, they, he wants to take it internationally in a certain segment of the market and he doesn't think they'll be interested. Well, what do you think when he takes the idea and runs with it and does really well and he's making millions of dollars, guess what'll happen? They'll be interested. <laughs> they'll say, what do you mean? That was our idea. You developed that when you were our vice president. <laughs> you, we're, we want that back. You know, that's our proprietary idea. So you gotta be careful on that. That, that, can, that can happen way too often. All right, so CT, what was CT? Amber, do you want to explain what it is? Okay, so what's the main problem? What do people do here? They way underestimate the total cost to get it going and the time it's gonna to take to get it going. I mean, in our minds we think, oh yeah, I can do this and this and this, and you can get it going in a couple months and you'll be making money so you don't have to have a lot of money saved up before you start bringing money in the door and that usually isn't the case. You usually have to have a lot bigger reserve of cash to feed your family with until your business starts bringing in some money. Okay, so this one is obviously related a bit to that one. You know, you want to quickly test it to see how bad this is going to be. You know, you might do a quick test and realize no one wants this cheap version that I can make easily and quickly I have to really redefine the product, make it much more interesting to the consumer before they'll buy it, and that's gonna take me a lot more time to get it developed and get it manufactured. All right, SE? Sustainability. Okay, any questions about that one? I mean, that's, I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, quickly test, how, how, do you, how do you quickly test a product? I thought, I saw something today, did, I, I didn't have a chance to read it, but someone said Gap came out with a new logo last week. Do you want to read that? Yeah. What, and they've already pulled it? No one likes it. Who is this? Gap, the store. So what, what do you, th I didn't see the logo. Did you like it? No, I didn't. You didn't like the new one? She, did you see the new one? Yeah, it's just kind of bland. I mean, their original one was so plain, but like everyone knew what it was. Don't you think, I mean, you think here, a huge company, don't you think they ran the new logo by hundreds and hundreds of people before they released it? You would have thought, unless they thought, oh, we'll keep it a surprise. We don't want it to, to filter out that we have a new logo. Well, that, that may have been one way of thinking about it, but look how it blew up on them. And maybe they planned it. You never know. I mean, look, they've got free advertising for Gap. You know, they put out this bad logo and it, may, it caught my attention. That's the first thing I've thought about Gap in a year by reading that news article. So maybe it was a planned event. You never know. So that's, we're, we're, we're gonna talk about that uh, in the future. How many know what guerrilla marketing is? You know? So there, there's all sorts of ways you can market your products without spending big advertising budgets on TV commercials, okay? There's, there's other ways. Um, what else do I think of? <coughs> yeah. So we talked about uh, a focus group. Does everyone remember what a focus group is? Hammond, what's a focus group? Okay. Anyone else want to beat up Ammon? No, it beats you. You weren't inviting. Bring it on. <laughs> beats me. See, isn't that a good example of, of an idiomatic expression we use? 
beats me. Yeah. No focus group one that helps you get your ideas, right? Yeah. You take it, you take it, present it to them, and then actually you usually record the group talking about it. And you see what people bring up about it. Okay. Um, how many, has anyone ever been invited to be a, a member of a focus group? Have you done it? Okay. Did you get paid for it or was it free? Okay. You know, sometimes you get paid to be a member of the focus group. They, you know, they're compensating you for your time to come in and talk about it. Johnny, would you collect the rest of the papers? T turn the papers. Yeah, put the number on the top and put them in the middle there. That's fine. Order doesn't, order doesn't matter. Uh, UP, what does UP stand for? Did we decide whether unique is different from proprietary? Uh, how many of you in your scripture reading, you'll see that the authors of some of the scriptures, they will use a word, you know, and synonyms, and they'll repeat it like great and abominable, or... You know, you'll, you'll look at that and say, hmm, are they synonyms? Or are they trying to give a slightly different description of it? Do you ever look at that and say, are they explaining it for emphasis and adding similar words that mean the same thing? Or are they trying to describe it with multiple things? Do you, do you see what I'm saying there? How many of you ever thought of that in the scriptures? Because you'll see it happens a lot in the scripture. Now that I've, I've tweaked your attention to it, the next time you read your scriptures, you're going to look at that and say, wow, he's using three or four adjectives to describe this. Are those adjectives because they want emphasis and they all mean the same thing? Or does each adjective give a little bit different view to look at the, the concept? Okay, so unique and proprietary. Is unique redundant when you're using proprietary, or are they slightly different? Okay, how, how are they different? Who said that? I heard two people. Anything you, any different stat there? The unique, I think, is one of a kind. Um, proprietary is more of the ownership of it. Okay. So I think there are two different, big differences. So it's more of a proprietary is that you have all reign and ownership, and unique is, like I said, it's just a one of a kind. Okay. Can you think of an example of something that's unique but not proprietary, or vice versa? Max? MP3 players. Okay. They were originally they were originally a sole company's idea, and then people started jumping on them. And so now what you have is because in order to compete with name brands like the iPad, most of them, most of the other brands have something unique about them that sets them apart from the generic iPod. I mean, it's the same thing with cars. Like you look, um, let's use another example. Uh, the thing that set Subaru apart was they made every single car four wheel drive. Didn't matter what kind of car it was, what model it was, it was four wheel drive. And that was like their unique thing. Yeah, I think there's some aspects of there. Obviously, it's not a cut and dried, you know, this is 100% unique and there's a big gap between the two. Amber, did you have something to add? Actually, let's. Uh, an interesting idea, but I don't. I don't think it fits exactly unique. I think that's a whole other alternative. You can say, do we want to go and try to be the best product out there? And then often that will affect how you price it. Okay. Um, 
How about maybe, maybe on the McDonald's theme, the Big Mac when it came out, what, 40 years ago, that was a little bit different. You know, it was different than your standard, you know, mustard, pickles, ketchup, hamburger, you know, special sauce, lettuce, cheese on a sesame seed bun. So they tried to make it unique. Uh, the problem was what you have happen is you start out being unique, but you can't keep it proprietary. Like Anthony talked about, you can't keep the ownership of the uniqueness, and so everyone can come along and copy you. Right? Well, you can patent the uniqueness. And then you can have, you can have a patent on your own mm -hmm. proprietorship. And then it's worth more. Then it's more than unique, and it's more than proprietary because it has a value on it. Mm -hmm. um, patents are, are somewhat useful, in my experience. This is my opinion. Some of you may have a different opinion. I have found about half the companies I've been associated with don't patent things because when you patent things, you file the patent with the patent office and you reveal how it's unique in, in, for everyone to see. So a lot of companies prefer to keep it what is called as a trade secret. Uh, and so that way they don't have to risk telling the public how it's made or how it's different, but then they can't obviously file for a patent for it. So the patent gives you legal protection for your proprietary ownership of it. The trade secret is just trying to keep it secret and accomplish it that way. What, what happens with a new electronic gizmo? It comes out and it's special. What do people do? Companies will take it apart and, and figure out how it's made. And so though it's called like reverse engineering. You know, you'll start with the finished product, you'll take it apart down to the pieces and see, ah, oh, this is how they made that. Max? I was, just, I was gonna add that uh, at what point does, uh, that, that's it's kind of just a, an interesting debate to bring up. At what point is it not unique enough to patent? Because there's a lot of debate over that right now, especially in tech field. Yeah. That's a, in, in the patent world, a lot of the patent offices are under fire because they patented little minor things that a lot of people don't consider unique enough to have ever gotten a patent. Um, so uh, I think we'll see in the next 20 years some real changes in patent law uh, and how things are allowed to be patented or whether they're not allowed. Okay. Uh, RS was what? Repeat sales. Repeat sales. Anyone give me an example of that? Anthony, you're on. <laughs> Typically, when you buy an iPod, you've got an iPod, and you're, you're good until, you know, it dies or whatever comes back. But, uh, for example, you know, a burger joint. Well, uh, let's stop there for a sec. How many of you are on more than one iPod that you've ever owned? Raise your hands. How over half have already bought a second iPod. How many are on your third iPod? One, two, three, four, five of you. Anyone you on your fourth already? Okay, back up on your car. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to a car. I mean, I, I think Apple's strategy there has been phenomenal because you know you're spending two, three hundred dollars, but then they break pretty easily. You get them wet. You have a problem with them. And they're almost disposable, but you paid two or three hundred bucks for them. But you stick with that brand, and you don't leave that brand. And so you get, amazingly enough, some pretty good repeat sales on iPods. So there, that, that was my example for repeat sales. OK. <laughs> Allie? Well, aside from iPod just like breaking or like being thrown in the water and or whatever, but like the fact that they're coming out with like new iPods. So that's taking repeat sales in a little different tangent. You say, how can I improve my product so I can get repeat sales? How can I make it different to drive people to buy it again from me? Max, do you have a comment? Well, hey, on that, it's just 
just improved enough to make people want to buy the new one, but uh, their cost and profit margin is enough that when Microsoft launched their Zoom, which is a which Apple knew was a very good product, it was enough that Apple dropped the price of the iPod in one day. They dropped every model by hundred dollars and didn't even sweat it. That's how much of a profit margin they're making. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the consumer reaction to that? People were just like, "Oh, it's Apple having a sale." But the Zoom did do very well because it, because it still was cheaper than the iPod counterpart. There, there was actually a segment of the population that was upset with that. Oh, yeah, because they bought the, the yeah. Th they bought them recently at a higher price, but also they sort of felt like, wow, you, you sold it to me for 400 and you're selling it again for 300 You felt sort of violated because they had made so much money off of you the first time. Yeah. So there was a little bit of consumer backlash. So a lot of these things you have to think through and really brainstorm. Everyone familiar with the term brainstorm? Yeah. You know, get together and evaluate all the different things that can happen. If I do this, they'll do this. If they do this, I'll do this. What if they do this? What will happen two years from now? You know, you always want to be thinking. That, that's why entrepreneurship is so fun because you are in the midst of this creative, never stopping, changing environment. You know, what, what you do with a, biz, a business today might be totally different two years from now. Okay? All right. Any questions on any of these? Okay. All right. Assignment then for a week from today is to come up with at least one more. You know, what else should we add? And if you can't think of one, at least maybe refine it. Take one of the eight and, and refine it and make it better. Okay? And the very best one that you come up with will uh, we'll give you some extra bonus. Maybe we'll uh, throw out a quiz score or something. So we'll, for, for a really good wow idea, we'll, we'll make it worth your while. Okay? What we're trying to do on the assignments. For example, um, I, read, uh, I haven't read all your assignments that you submitted today, but one of the first ones I read, the person started off their essay saying, off the top of my head, the two ideas that I could do better are, how do you think that struck me? They didn't take time to do it. Tell me to redo it. I actually said, I said, you missed the purpose. I said, I wanted you to, what was, what was on the bottom of the assignment, what did I say to do? Pray and ponder about it. You know, if you just take the first things that come to your mind, that might work many times. You know, sometimes your best idea will be your first idea, your first prompting, your first inclination. You know, when, when you're paying, playing Jeopardy or a trivial pursuit, lots of times the first answer that comes to your mind is the right one. But if you're doing a self-exploration assignment like this was for today, we wanted you to think and remember the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth idea that came to mind, then look at all six and, saw, and decide well, which two were really that important, okay? So what we're trying to do here, remember, we're trying to light a fire in you to be a good social entrepreneur. We're not here to give you a grade. We're trying to, to cause that something will happen in your life that you'll be a different person when you leave BYU Hawaii, okay? I mean, I, I honestly cannot remember hardly anything I learned in college. I mean, come on, let's be honest. I, didn't remember, I don't remember today, but there are a few skills that I learned that have stayed with me. Like, I, I remember when I was in, just before I went on my mission, I had, a, they, they started a, a mission preparatory class, a mission prep class in, in my stake. And it was the same time as my Sunday school class. And we had a fantastic Sunday school teacher. And he said, well, come over to my house at 7 a.m. and I'll give you the Sunday school lesson. So he volunteered to take and teach the, the lesson a second time for everyone who was going to miss his class that day. And I remember him as a, a person who changed my life. He taught me how to recognize the Spirit. And that's the first time I really started to be aware of the Holy Ghost. 
And so I don't really remember much that he said. There's one other famous quote that he told me. Have I told you this before? This is one, your only real fear in life will be your inability to, and here's the big one to remember, discipline yourself. Quinn Gardner, your only real fear, real fear in life will be your inability to discipline yourself. All the other fears that you think are maybe fears, maybe really aren't. And this is really only the, the bottom line fear. What? What year was this? Okay. 1976. Ryan. Um, what did you, were we going to do the other quotes from? We are. We're right on that right now. So while we're talking here, get out your Eunice quotes that you didn't have a chance to, uh, to share last Thursday. And also from your group discussion, if your group didn't get a chance to share the three ideas that you came up with, only about half of them got through that. Okay. I have seen this quote. This is an example of a quotation that I have seen revalidated every two or three years of my life. Something will come up and I'll say, oh yeah, this is an example of that. All right. So how did I get off on that? Quotation. Oh, oh, we're talking about what you're really going to learn in school, right? Uh -huh. Does anyone have something that changed your life in elementary school? You know, do you, I don't remember, you know, all those things I learned. I mean, I remember a lot of things I learned, but nothing really stands out. But I remember in second grade, I had a teacher that if we got done with our homework or our classwork, we could go in the corner and read in the corner and she had all these books there, and I found my Freddy the Pig book. So uh, that she she started me off on my my hero book. Uh, yes. Um, all right. She uh, Sharon wants uh, an example of that. Um, probably. Let me give you an example. That, uh, when you're on your mission and you are trying to live the mission rules and you're struggling with getting up at 6.30 and getting out of the apartment at 9.30 and tracting so many hours, et cetera, you know, you have, you have, you have a set of rules as a missionary. Um, I think that's a good example of that where it's really the struggle inside yourself. It's me, as Stephen Covey said, mind over mattress. That I'm not, I'm not worried about the mission president, I'm not worried about the prophet, I'm not worried about my parents. It comes down to me Disciplining myself and getting it done. That's laziness, fear. Well, the discipline to overcome my laziness. You know, that, that most of the problems in life come back to something inside of us. You know, I, I can't blame my problems on Anthony or, or Max, or even though I'd like to shove it off on them. You know, if you don't do well, for example, here at BYU Hawaii, it, it really is going to come down to how late you stayed out, how much you spent time doing other things, how much you were distracted by 
parties and relationships and other things that you didn't discipline yourself to do the basics of your homework and to do the basics of your class. So if you don't get good grades in your classes, it's no one's fault but yourself and your inability to discipline yourself. Any other ideas come to mind when we're discussing that? Yes. I think the fear of it too is, of, is people who attempt to apply themselves without a fear of failure. They, they, they find themselves lazy because they're afraid that if they do try, they'll still fail. And so uh, it's, overcoming, it's overcoming that inner battle as well. Oh, interesting. So they're lazy because they have a fear of failure. A fear of failure, so they're, they're hmm. almost done. Interesting. Does everyone understand what this means? <laughs> Getting out of bed in the morning, disciplining your mind to say, all right, it's 6 a.m., I need to get off my mattress. <laughs> so you will your mind to be in charge, and your mattress doesn't win and pull you back into the, the feather down comforter. Yes. A personal question? Sure. Do I have to answer it though? No. <laughs> what time? I mean, being a man that's, you know, a veteran in life and successful or not, what time did you uh, wake up normally through the majority of your adult life? I, I'm just an early riser. It, it, it really is sort of a biorhythm. I usually get up at four, five, six. I get my best work done in the morning. My wife, my wife isn't, you know. She, she would prefer to sleep in until eight. Uh, so, but I can say this. If you've never tried it, if you think that you aren't a morning person, at least do an experiment in your life and try it. Say, all right, for the month of November, I am going to get up an hour and a half before I usually ever want to. So let's say you normally would like to get up at eight. You say, all right, every day in the month of November, I'm gonna try it and get up at 6.30 and see what it does for me. And then at the end of November, you, you do an evaluation and say, was my life better? Was I happier? Did I get more done? Was I more or less tired during the rest of the day from what I did during this experiment? And so it's like doing it's like doing a little focus group on your own life. You know, you tested an idea. And you'll find mostly as you get older, most older people start to just get up earlier anyway and they go to bed earlier. It's just sort of a natural thing I think that happens in life. JJ? At what time would you go to bed? I, I usually can get by on six, six and a half hours of sleep. So I try to get to bed at 10, 30 and, you know, get up at, you know, Five, five thirty, six. But I'm one of these guys. I don't set an alarm clock. I, I just let it happen. So my body just sort of gets up. And, you know, everyone, everyone will be different on that. But what I want you to remember is experiment. If you think you can't do it, try it to see if there's a change in your life. You know? Everyone's, if, if you get stuck in your routines, is, isn't that sort of a, one of the heart of an entrepreneur is they break the molds. They try things that other people either haven't thought of or have thought of and were not disciplined or didn't think it would work so they didn't even try. In general though, I would say over half of you would dramatically improve your life if you got up earlier and went to bed earlier. I know that's I have college kids. I know that is not, you know, college lifestyle. But if you try that, it will have an impact on your life. You know, I, here, here's, in fact, here's an here's a insight that came to me. Uh, I, I think it's inspired. Uh, I compared night and day to the crucifixion and the resurrection, you know? Crucifixion is night, darkness. The resurrection is light, new birth, arising. And so I think that's a comparison between 
the light of the day and the darkness of the night. So there is something, if, if we are to seek good things in life, we should seek for the resurrection, right? And not the crucifixion necessarily. So you should be drawn to the light and getting up with the sun and having a, a resurrection and a new life for you and avoid the darkness of the crucifixion, the darkness of the nighttime when, when there is less light. You know, as an entrepreneur, you want to be inspired. You want God to be giving you ideas. You will get many more ideas at dawn watching the sun come up than you will at 2 a.m. when it's dark and you're tired and, you know, I, I, I just know that from personal experience and I've heard, if you've heard most of the general authorities, I've never heard a general authority say, I was staying up late and God gave me this idea to tell you. I've never heard him say that, but I've heard many general authorities say, in the early morning hours, I got up and here's what I was given from God. All right. JJ. Is it like related to exercise when you do your first set, you, you have the most strength, you can do the most repetitions, but then when you get to your last set or towards the end of the workout, you're a lot more tired and you can't do as much? Obviously, until I don't know much about exercise. So I'm going to have to take your word for that. <laughs> hey, but I have. I've been doing better here. I have, I have swam, played tennis, and golf more since I came to Hawaii than I did in the last six months. But a lot of that is because God has done great things for me. I mean, I can witness to you, brothers and sisters, when you do your part, God will help you out. <laughs> he's done it again for me. He, he's done it dozens of times in my life. And as I think I've explained to you earlier, before I came here this semester, my business was, was in the toilet. <laughs> Things were tough. There was a, uh, there was a cloud over my, my business. I calculated yesterday. And in fact, I think, did I put this on the board the other day? Um, I, I recalculated it. Rise. My rise. I, th I, I thought it was 12%. I calculated 22% so far in five weeks of being here on a, you know, like a mission. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, so, you know, it doesn't happen all the time. Remember the idea that you can smoke or you cannot smoke and keep the word of wisdom and you can still get lung cancer? So just because you keep the commandments doesn't mean absolutely 100% you'll prosper. Good people pay their tie lead every day of their life, or every, you know, consistently in their lives, and they're still scraping to get by and have financial reversals and never have enough money to be, you know, satisfied with a basic standard. So, okay, so everyone clear on that? I'm not saying you keep the commandments and you'll be rich. In general, though, when you keep the commandments, good things can happen. Heavenly Father is more naturally able to help you. And actually, we'll talk more about this on Thursday. I'm, I'm in, in my lecture, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about that and how it works a little more. So just remember that. I hope, I hope what I say, my, my evidence in my life, gives you inspiration and, and a desire to say, all right, I'm going to keep the commandments a little better, and, and I'm going to watch and wait and see Heavenly Father's help in my life and have faith. I, what I want you to, isn't that the purpose of a testimony? Someone shares their testimony to give you more faith, to try it? Yes, I believe this Book of Mormon is true, Brother, Brother Brown. If I give you this copy of the Book of Mormon, will you read it and see if God tells you it's true like he's told me it's true? Isn't that, isn't that the same principle that, you know, we're trying to take people's evidence and see if it applies in our life? All right, who has a Eunice quote they want to share with us? Who has the next one? Take out your Eunice quotes. All right, Natalie. Okay. Oh, sorry. We're going gonna... to do the mic here.
Anyone else have the same quote? Close, Michael? I have uh, something similar. Okay, let's hear yours. So this one is, my greatest challenge has been to change the mindsets of people. Mindsets play tra uh, strange tricks on us. We see things the way our minds have instructed our eyes to see. So. Okay. You're, you're talking about changing mindsets. Hers mm -hmm. actually talked about one specific, one specific mindset, mindset he suggested to change. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yours was the general concept. Yours was specific. Okay. Different enough. Okay. All right. I, I, I really liked your quote. You want to read yours again? Yeah, don't put it away. You remember you're turning it in. Oh, okay. Uh, we have to get out of this mindset that the rich will do the business and the poor will have the charity. Thank you. I know that, that inspires me. I, I really, that opens up a vision for me, is we're not just giving charity to the poor. We're giving them a chance to be their own entrepreneurs. We have to get out of this mindset, this is bad, that the rich will be the business people and the poor will just get the charity from the rich business people. Okay? If we think it's here and here and never the twain shall meet, we've got to break that mold. We've got to have the, you know, what, what does it say? What does King Mosiah say or King Benjamin say? To the poor people he says, I would that if you had sufficient means that you would be inclined to give as well. So he wants to have the poor people also be the givers of charity to others around them. All right, Michael, you have yours? Here we are. All right, next. Uh, this sort of relates to that too. It's, it's not, the quote's not similar, but it relates to the same concept. Um, it was a, uh, he was, he was at a conference talking about the differences between uh, a social business and a profit, a for-profit business, um, and comparing the two, he talked about how, uh, I'll just, I'll kind of read the preface if you don't mind, it's, I, I kind of wrote a preface, uh, he explained that there are social solutions to many of the problems in the world, but since there's no profit in these solutions, businesses won't help, people who have money uh, won't invest in it because there's not a return. Um, for example, there are cures and vaccines for most of the deadly diseases people who live in poverty are dying from. Pharmaceut pharmaceutical companies won't manufacture vaccines for these diseases because there's no profit in it. And so this is his quote. He said, um, before that, his talk was leading up to this quote, he said, what kind of world is this? Should we leave everything to the decisions of the profit maximizers so that their benefit is what decides the world? Or is there something else we can bring in, or something else to bring in? That is the basic question. Like that as well. Anyone have anything like that? Mine's kind of similar. Okay. Thanks, Pat. Oh. How far away are you supposed to hold this thing? Seven and a half inches. Seven and a half. All right. Right about there. Oh yeah. There we go. Yeah. Um. The quote I got was from uh, the book he wrote. It says, uh, my experience has shown me that the free market, powerful and useful as it is, could address problems like global poverty and environmental degradation, but not if it must cater solely and relentlessly to the financial goals of its richest shareholders. That went, I went too fast for you. Rep repeat that one more, Max. A little more slowly. My experience has shown me that the free market, powerful and useful as it is, could address problems like global poverty and environmental degradation, but not if it must cater solely and relentlessly to the financial goals of its richest shareholders. So pretty simple. Pr profit maximizing is in general is okay, but if that's the only reason you're running your business, you know, he says you should have other reasons that you could do that to reach out to do these other social goals. All right? Yeah. One of you asked, uh, how, how many words was your assignment minimum today? 137. Now, one of you asked, why was that? Did anyone look at that number and say, 137, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Now, how many of you asked to find out? Ryan did. Okay. Did it, 
So you, you see there, it crossed many of your minds, but how many of you did something to find out why? Okay, We're, we want to, to whack you a bit to make you think and to do and to ask questions and not be content with the way things are. So when you saw a funny 137 number, that should have made your antenna, right? Your, do you remember, anyone ever seen the old TV show, My Favorite Martian? About a Martian who crash landed on Earth, and you know, this was in the 60s, and so they had a little antenna that could rise out of the back of his head. You know, so it was, it was pretty hokey, but that, it sort of symbolizes when something catches your attention, you know, your antenna rise, and you're trying to tune in to that. Allie? Are you telling us why you chose 137? Absolutely no reason, except to get your attention. Okay. Is that the same with Thursday's assignment? Uh-huh. Okay. Sorry, now you know my trade secret. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I got that idea. See, that wasn't my idea. I got that from a, a, a place where I used to live where the posted speed limit in this gated community was 17 miles an hour. And you wouldn't believe how many of our visitors would come and say, what is this with 70 miles an hour? You know, it caught their attention. And so they, they were more aware of how fast they were driving when it was such an odd number. You know, if 25 miles an hour, I mean, in fact, it's interesting. Coming through uh, La Ie, you know, from the south, it, the speed limit drops from 35 to 25, right? You haven't noticed? It does that. Yesterday, as we're driving here, my wife looked at that and said, wow, it's 25 through here? And I said, yes, honey. <laughs> she had driven that way, what now, 30 times, and she'd never seen the 25 mile an hour speed limit there. Because it was just so normal, natural. But I guarantee if it said 19 or 17 or 13 miles an hour, people would remember that. And it would stick out because it was different. Okay. All right, who's next on their quote? Do you want to write the check out to me there? He, yeah, exactly. He brings his checkbook to class. Now, that is a smart student. I'd rather put that away. All right, mine is, mine is simple, but it's the one that stood out most to me, and partly because of a movie that I recently saw. But business money is limitless. And um, that stood out most to me because I feel like it has endless meanings for both positive and negative. But R read it again one more time. Bus business money is limitless. Business money is limitless. limitless. Business money is okay. limitless. And what do you think that means? And what I, what I interpret that as is it's so easy to get caught up into the business world and to put all other things aside. And us having the gospel, knowing that family, morals, values, things of this nature are important. And um, it, is, it is literally limitless. And then I, this won't ruin the movie for those of you who haven't seen it, but the, that new Wall Street movie, Shia LaBeouf asks one of the big wigs on Wall Street, asks him, what's your number? And she's like, well, what do you mean, you know? And he's like, I believe everyone has a number if they just get to this point. Kind of something you were sharing with us in class. If you just get to this point, you can walk away. And the guy said, more, you know? And so it doesn't get into the guy's personal life, but I can take it that he probably doesn't have a family or whatever. And um, anyways, I feel like Muhammad Yunus had a really good thing going here where it's, it's not about the money. My dad always told us that if you have a business idea, make it so that it's not about the money. Make it so it's about the idea and the people that you're trying to serve. And then eventually the money and things like this will come along. If it's something that's good, it'll grow. Um, so if you get caught up in the money aspect and the business aspect, you can find yourself lost eventually. And yeah. Would you recommend the movie? I think it's epic. Have you seen it yet? It's, you said it's what? It's epic. Yeah. Epic. Yeah. It's really good. Wow. I think, uh, yeah, okay. and it has a really good, and it has that good moral side to it also where um, you need to not get caught up in. Guerrilla marketing at its best. All the craziness. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I took this quotation a different way. Did anyone else see a different interpretation on this one? Yeah. Allie? Um, I kind of saw it as like the Kiva investments. Yeah. Where Okay. Different way? Yeah, I was just seeing it as like something that can be like used for business. Yeah. Like rules 
You saw this as business income coming into the entrepreneur is limitless. I saw it as more business capital, the access to get capital if you have the right way of getting it is limitless. Well, that's why I said it, it can go both ways. Okay. It can be, go both good and it can be really bad. But that was the way that I looked at it more so because of having been recently influenced by that movie. Okay. All right. would, would anyone not recommend the movie that saw it? Oh, oh, I saw. <laughs> I don't get it. He's retarded. I don't want to comment on this. So I don't. All right. Next, next one. Come on. We only got through ten last week. We got a, another twenty to do today. It's kind of a long one. It's not a short one. It's long and short. This time. Okay. It says poor people are like bonsai trees. A little tree. Pick the seed of the tallest tree in the forest and take the best seed out of it and plant it in a flower pot. You get a tiny little tree, we call it bonsai. Nothing wrong with the seed, you've got the best seed possible. Nothing wrong with the tree because you actually picked the tallest tree in the forest, but actually it grows this far. Why? Because we put them in the flower pot, the base. Society is the base and the society is so stingy that it doesn't give the poor people the space to grow. So I say change the base. If you change the base, anybody will be as tall as anybody else. My belief is poverty is not caused by poor people. Poverty is caused by the system. Poverty is caused by the policies that we pursue. That's awesome. So, is, is, I'm not a botanist. If, Give her 10 points. If you, uh, it, it, I took from that is if you leave it in a small pot, the pot limits the size of the tree. Is that what it says? And so if we keep the poor in a small pot, they might have great potential, but we're not giving that opportunity to flower. Okay. Anyone else see it differently? Max? I, I don't entirely disagree with it, but I think it's not entirely true because they, I mean, there are a lot of cases, for example, in the US, there's plenty of poor people who have been given plenty of opportunities to better their situation who just won't. So I don't think it's necessarily the problem. I mean, you, there are plenty of people who are like, you know, like you said, you know, they're, they're okay. 10% right. will grow given the chance. There's a lot of people at the same time who would rather not. Mm -hmm. and, and even among our students here at BYU Hawaii, right? I mean, you're given amazing opportunities here. The church is subsidizing your education dramatically here. And you see a lot of your peers that are just, you know, twittering away their life here and not really taking advantage of this unique time and just, you know, they haven't had the slap on the side of the head to wake up. Anthony? Well, I thought it was interesting, the comment about society, and I think in either case there's a good argument, but I saw it as uh, society being an inhibitor, as uh, Eunice says, being the pot, and not allowing the roots to be able to grow. And so I think there's a lot more, and I mean, there are a few um, outside the case that can say, you know what, I'm not gonna be determined by society. And those are the you know, high, highly effective social entrepreneurs. But even with Eunice, if he had stayed in the state that everybody else had been in and not had the education he had received, he'd probably be one of those in the whole planet. So I think that society does kind of uh, hinder and kind of handicap those in the mentality of, you know, maybe you need to rely on the system and just kind of conform to the norm instead of being like, you have more than this as potential. You have so much more potential mm -hmm. and yet you're conforming. Okay. You know what a straw poll is? Just, you know, when you're, you're doing a quick hands up of, of something. How many of you, at, to this point in the course, think now that you, yeah, let me word it right here. Just listen to me for a second to try and see where I'm going with this. How many of you now, after what we've learned in the first eight classes, think you have what it takes to be a social entrepreneur, or vice versa, how many of you think, maybe this really isn't quite me? So how many of you think more likely that you're a, a social entrepreneur type? Right. How many of you 
this class is sort of helping you say, no, maybe this isn't for me. Couple? Okay. And, and that's, that's, that's perfect. That's what we want to have happen. That, that, this class is probably benefiting the two of you better than the rest of them to help you get off, you know, the wrong track, you know. How, what's the old adage is the person spent all their life climbing the ladder only to find it was leaning against the wrong wall? <laughs> I mean, think about all the people you've seen in your life that do that. Parents, other people, they spend all this effort, like probably the guy in the movie, probably Michael Douglas, and at the end of his life, he realized it's against the wrong wall. He's been climbing for something that doesn't bring him lasting happiness. Gosh, what, don't you think Heavenly Father is pretty sad when he looks at all the people here on the earth that are clamoring after money? and money, 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 and that's the object for their life. And don't you think he's up in heaven just sort of crying maybe and looking at him and saying, they just don't get it. I mean, that, that must really be sad for him. I don't know about you, but I, I'm more of a control person. I would, if I were him, I would just want to control people's lives a little more and, no, don't go after the money. Do this, you know, it'll bring you greater joy and, and happiness. So Heavenly Father has a lot of restraint, doesn't he? He is really, as, they, as I said earlier, sitting on his hands maybe, trying to keep from interfering with people's lives. He really is very patient and long-suffering in letting people play out their true natures instead of quickly stepping in and saying, you're on the wrong track. He is, is, it, is that... Isn't that an exciting concept, how patient Heavenly Father is? And how long he lets us go down that wrong road just because he knows it'll be a really good experience for us? Yeah. You ready? Pa Pauline, right? Yeah. Okay. Everybody, do you go by Pauline? Yeah. Okay. Well, for those of you who came in late, uh, at the beginning of class, we, we said your names and where you were... Uh, where you were born. So why don't you, a few of you came in late, so. My name where I was born? Yeah. Uh, my name is Pauline and I was born in New Zealand. Okay. All right, who else, who else came in late? Shanghai? All right, tell us your name and where you're born. Uh, I'm Shanghai, I'm born in Taiwan. Taiwan. Who else didn't get to tell us where they were born? All right. I'm Teresa and I was born in was there some New Zealand thing this morning going on? <laughs> what? Oh, oh you, your roommates? Well, I know you're saying the same place. I was saying the two from New Zealand were, were late this morning. Yeah. Who else? Oh, JJ? I was born in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Okay. And your name? Yeah, so everyone can get to know you better. Jared Joseph. Everybody goes by JJ. Did everyone sign the roll, Johnny? Uh, I think everyone's ready. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, thank you, Pauline. So you're both from Auckland. Yeah. Did you know each other before you came here? Are you from the same part of Auckland now that you realize, oh, you only lived a mile away or something? What? Okay. All, right. All right, here we go. Um, nothing in the economic theories I taught reflected the life around me. How could I go on telling my students make-believe stories in the name of economics? I needed to run away from the theories and from the textbooks and discover the real-life economics of a poor person's existence. Any, anything like this in your quotes? I, th I think this is an example of this quote a bit, that he realized his academic training wasn't meshing up to the real world, and he had to discipline himself to deny his academic training and get out there and see what the real world was really doing with the poor. Who's next? That.
mine is one day our grandchildren will go to museums to see what poverty was like. Well, that's the one we had on the board. <laughs> you can't use that one. I had that one. All right, I was, I was watching um, one of the YouTube videos, and this is what Cody spoke on. He says, each of us have much more hidden inside of us than we had the chance to explore unless we create an environment that enables us to discover the limits of our potential. We will never know what we have inside of us. He talked about um, having the potential to, to be able to go out there and to, to seek for things that um, other people need and be able to benefit them. So. And read it one more time for us. Listen, everyone. Each of us has much more hidden inside of us than we had the chance to explore unless we create an environment that en enables us to discover the limits of our potential. We will never know what we have inside of us. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's very inspiring. So I, did you have a hard copy for me? Um, I turned it in last week. Okay. Did you read last week? No, but you asked for it. Okay. Did I get your copy already? Yeah. All right. Who else has one? We're getting the last few here. Okay. Oh. I'm sorry? Oh, that was yours, huh? All right. Okay. <coughs> Did we already read it? Yes. Okay. Wait. Oh, okay. My kind of journal, it says that the states for poverty, um, the states for poverty are buried in the institutes. So I think this one, this quote, he tried to mention how important education is can help people get rid of poverty. Yeah. And so I think that's why we all come over here to get education to like avoid the chance to be poor like again. Uh -huh. yeah. it, so if, if we looked at the world, are there very many rich people that are poorly educated? I guess so sometimes. There, there probably are a few, right? Mm. Uh -huh. yeah. now, look at the example. What, what, what did Joseph Smith do? He had a, what, a fourth grade education formally, but uh -huh. then later on he hires a Hebrew tutor and they have the school of the prophets, and he's learning, learning, learning as an adult. You know, so he didn't get the education as a child, but he's like a sponge okay. and just an amazing learner, you know, as an adult. Well, I used to thought about this question too, because many rich people they probably don't have master's degree. Maybe they they drop the school when they attend to college, but they if you know what was the best thing about getting an MBA from Harvard for me? Mike's pastry. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's getting what we say in English a foot in the door. It got me a job between my first and second year, an internship at the largest mutual fund firm in the world. And so that got me into my future career. And then other firms I went to interview with, they said, oh, you're an analyst with Capital Guardian? Wow, you know? So that really was a nice resume builder for me. So I don't remember what we taught about our investment classes. I don't remember how to use the formulas but it got me into the right job. So, you know, w think about what's the purpose of your education? All right, what are you gonna do with all these, these notes? Burn them. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna burn your computer, yeah. huh? Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. preserve them for eternity. No, seriously, if you're like me, you take a lot of notes and then they Store. never get looked at again. Yeah. It, I'll tell you a funny story. Before I came here, I actually pulled out some of my college notes. And one of them was a case. Do you know what a case is? It's a, it's a business uh, example that you use in business classes to evaluate the business and look at, you know, it's like a story about a business. One of those was written by my office mate, Dr. Croft.
<laughs> so I thought, wow, that is, that is so bizarre that a case I had saved, I looked and he had actually been the one to write it. You know, so that's an interesting twist. But I had never taken it out from 1980 till 2010 until I got materials together here to come to BYU Hawaii. So it sat in my filing cabinet for 30 years unlooked. So are we, are we here to have you take lots of notes? Like it's interesting. Some of you take lots of notes. I was noticing Thad here, you, you haven't taken one note today, have you? Uh -huh. No, see? See, some of you have different styles, but the key is how are you going to remember what we talked about in class today? It, there's got to be something we talked about in this first hour that you can use in your life someday. So I would suggest, if I were doing it again, I would have some type of review system where I can look at my notes a year, five years, ten years, and look through them and say, wow, oh yeah, that I learned in that class. Hey, I can apply that in my current position. So have some way of reviewing the best of what you can do from your cl all your classes. Maybe at the end of the semester, maybe the first week of summer, you just go through and you take, you know, 100 pages of notes and you condense it down to two pages. And you say, here's the really the best stuff that I want to remember. And then throw away, as Anthony said, burn the other 100 pages, because you're really never going to use them. But take the very best and then say, all right, how am I going to use this? All right, here's a really good idea. I like it. Do I have the discipline to implement it in my life? I mean, I, like, didn't I tell you, I, I have like five books. I have five different files of books that I have started to write. And they aren't written. You know, they aren't finished. So I have these good intentions. I have good ideas, but I haven't finished it. So are those books helping me or helping the world or anything? No, because I haven't had the discipline to get it done. You're, you're, who had the quote? Abby? OK. Um, well, after hearing everyone else's quotes, I don't feel like it was as deep when, as when I read it. I liked it a lot. But um, it's pretty simple. It just says, the basis of selfishness is created and it takes the form of conventional business that we see where we accumulate everything for ourselves. But I'm proposing to cre create another kind of business based on selflessness, where getting things for myself is not the intention. The intention is to make it happen to others and nothing for me. And I'm calling it social business. So, I mean, it's clear how it applies, but I really liked the, the contrast of selfishness and selflessness and how there's two kinds of business that you can make from these two kinds of attitudes. I think you like that because that was the gospel there, wasn't it? Yeah. Is it that resonated with you because that's, that's what the gospel is. Trying to turn us to do things selflessly instead of by ourselves. Alright, any other quote? Oh, we still got a few here. Oh, oh, it's still connected. It's all right. Okay, there we go. I'm encouraging young people to become social business entrepreneurs and contribute to the world rather than just making money. Making money is no fun. Contributing to and changing the world is a lot more fun. How many believe that? How many believe making money isn't fun? Just making money? No. What's the long term? I mean, the devil has made a good business out of making money look fun. He's very successful at that. And yeah. addicting. Wall Street. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> what? I got a same one. Oh, the same one? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Boston. Remember you said they could, you guys had to do a good out No, we just get like three points instead of four. Yeah. And remember, the, the purpose of life it isn't points, right? <laughs> Any, all right. All right. I'd like to see the final score when I get there. Uh, mine is, if you are a socially conscious person, why don't you run your business in a way that will achieve social objectives? 
lecture, I'm going to give an explanation. No, let's just think about that for a bit. Re read it one more time and just let it sink in. If you are a socially conscious person, why don't you run your business in a way that will achieve social objectives? Put, so, put that in Mormon terms. So I was thinking like being a, like all of us doing a good deed for others and serving each other and loving your neighbors and stuff like that. We're all socially people and we're conscious about what other people need and like how we can give it to them. So if we're all socially conscious people, then we should think long term about social business. Basically, we, if, if we're LDS and we talk about this on Sundays, we need to put it into practice Monday through Friday. I think that's what I got from that quote. We, we, we say we're, we're good people. We need to show that not just in our religious life, but our business life. All right. Okay. Um, mine is, I may not be useful as an economist, but I'm still a basic human being. I could just go out and stand next to a human being and see if there's anything I can do to another person. Even for a day, if it will help pay for more, I feel a little bit better. And I like this because it made it more realistic to me, and like it didn't put it on a huge, like, um, like big company scale. Like, even, I mean, I'm not going to do anything like that anytime soon. So, I mean, if I can start by being a decent human being, like, that's a start. Like, that's how Muhammad Yunus did. Like, he just gave a loan to, or gave $27 to some women, and look where he's at now, so. All right, hand it back there. How many questions? <clears throat> um, business has a greater ability than charity to innovate, expand, and reach people through the power of the free market. You guys heard that one already? I think so. Dang does, that it. Sound, does that sound familiar? Who had it? Did anyone remember that one? All right, we'll, we'll look Apparently it up. Apparently no one did, so. All right. <laughs> Any others? Free markets, kind of words can be used a lot, guys. Okay. Um, poverty is not created by poor people. It is an artificial imposition on individuals and families with fewer resources than others. People are endowed with the same unlimited potential for creativity and energy as any human being in any station of life. Okay. Right. Thank you. Any others we missed? So we got to get two more real quick here. <laughs> okay, so one that I had is the best way to start is to start in one's own neighborhood. You don't have to jump off to another place that you know very little about. Okay. Start. I think that was one of the key points he said is start with what's in front of your face. All right. Any others? Not sure. Okay. Mine was if you can make so many people happy with such a small amount of money, why shouldn't you do more of it? And I just took that as like, if it's simple and it's a good thing, just keep doing it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Any others to turn in? All right. 